Today on Above the Parapet, we're going to speak to Juliet Lyon, who is the Director of Prison Reforms Trust and Secretary General of Penal Reform International. So your personal experiences of minor and more significant levels of, of your experience of sexism in the workplace, um, I'd be interested to know what have you had as a, as a coping mechanisms or where do you get your resilience from when you realise that you were, you were having such challenges? I think if you suspect for a minute that, that people aren't going to take you seriously or aren't going to listen, then, then you do employ strategies. So one would be talking slowly and clearly, not using jargon, but being very clear about the points you want to make. It might mean following something up in writing, thanking someone for a meeting and then saying these are the points we discussed and this is the action that we're expecting will mm. be taken. More often than not, I'll be meeting a male minister um, and trying to um, persuade, um, using evidence rather than using anything else, but persuade them to look at justice reform and things that obviously need to change. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'll do that by putting it across very clearly. I'll do it by following up. Um, I'll do it by not um, not really feeling that there there needs to be an introduction of gender. That that. Uh, would that be relevant? Probably not. It might be if I was doing the part of our work which is about reducing women's imprisonment because I'd be, in that instance, reaching across the domestic violence sphere, pointing out that the vast majority of women in prison have also, as well as being perpetrators of crime, have been victims of domestic abuse, of sexual abuse, rape sometimes. Um, so they've often been victims of serious crime. Um, and they've been perpetrators of petty, persistent offending. Um, and if I'm talking about women, I might then be using arguments that, that drew attention to their, their gender and mine. Mm. Um, but otherwise, I'd, I'd try for gender neutral. We're finding that women don't tend to be, in the main, um, at parity with men in terms of senior levels of civil society, of voluntary organisations. But you mentioned you'd seen that more women are coming to the top. Um, I wonder if you could tell me about your experience of why you think maybe more women are now rising to levels of seniority in the voluntary sector. Why would they be rising to the top? I think because, you know, in general, women are coming through in terms of public services. Quite often there's an interchange between work in public, the public sector and work in the charitable sector. Um, and you are seeing more women um, being promoted. You're seeing women... You know, if you look at any profession, if you look at the medical profession, you see more women now training to be doctors um, and, and coming through and becoming consultants and so forth. So there is a bit of a shift. It feels agonisingly slow. Um, there is still a very big gender pay gap, which one can't justify, I think, on any front. Um, and I think women still feel that they are, if they are going to rise to the top in a career, they're going to have to do that kind of come what may and they're, they're, they're going to have to make the adjustments. What has been your experience of balancing your, your private life um, with the significant responsibilities that come with heading a, a large um, charitable organisation? Uh, well, I've got two children um, and, and you'd have to ask them whether, what kind of a mother they've had. I, I've worked, um, apart from taking a few months maternity leave and, and dropping... I'm trying to think, well, I dropped a bit of part time into part time work for a short while. I think, I can't even remember. But I mean, it's been a question of making things work. You know, if you want to do something, you make it work. Because I remember going back to work um, with fairly inadequate childcare, but thinking I've just got to make this work. Um, but seeing it as my responsibility, I think that's very definitely how I felt. It didn't feel like a much of a shared responsibility. Mm. Uh, my partners had. Um, very demanding jobs um, and so consequently you know it's a question of just making things possible and making it work and uh, I suspect what I've cut down on is sleep that I just ha you know have learnt to have short nights mm. um, because there's a lot of other things to do. It's one thing we found actually from other women working in the voluntary sector other women in senior levels within the voluntary sector that the type of work they do feeds into or allows them to have the resilience to put up with the breadth of work and the responsibilities mm. and mm. going home and taking on care responsibilities and, and balancing many things. Yes. Would you say that's similar to... Would you? Yeah, I think so. And I think there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and if you're not a kind of hard and fast boundary drawer, I mean, I would forever drag work home and then the children will be asleep and we start working again. Or, you know, that, that, that 
and I'm not saying that's necessarily a very good thing, it's not an advert for a way of being, but it, it means that you can still achieve in your job. Mm -hmm. And so I've never been the person who's drawn very strict lines and said, I finish work at X time, and that's going to be it until Y time. Mm. Um, you know, we run an advice and information service, for example, at the Prison Reform Trust, it responds to about 6,500 prisoners a year. Um, across the weekend, um, when we we need to have people on call, um, we're a very small charity, so I'll have a phone in my pocket, and I might be phoned by somebody's mum who's wondering where he's turned out and what prison he's in, or somebody who's very anxious about a prisoner who might be suicidal. Um, equally, I might be rung up by the media and asked to book in and do a quick radio interview over the phone or something. Mm. And I, I don't tend to have that, I don't tend to press the off switch on the phone. Um, another thing that we've heard is a lot of the interviewees we've spoken to have talked about the role of mentors or support networks or networks in their lives that have been useful for them um, as they progress through their, their professional journey. Is this, um, does that have any resonance with, with your journey? Mm, to, uh, to an extent. I mean, you, you know, one sadness I remember was that I, a group of my friends, because my friends matter very much to me, and a group of them formed a women's book group. But because I was travelling for work and doing different things, I could kind of never quite get there. So it was outside of that. But um, there, are, there are particular people in my life who I think have helped you know, significantly. You know, Quaker cousin, some very good women friends, um, other charity directors two or three who I spend time with, um, you know, just so that you can kind of check different things. Um, and a couple of the trustees mm -hmm. who have been tremendous professional friends. So, uh, it, yes, it does matter. It's not a kind of thing that you want to go to in isolation. But I haven't had a formal mentoring process. Mm. Mm. Even still at the at very senior levels, the, the benefits of, of having somebody you can speak to, particularly among senior peers who are going through similar professional yes. lives as you. I think it's, I mean, if you talk to another woman running a charity, for example, she'll, she'll understand that on the, one, on the one hand, you're trying to go for um, major goals, you know, they might be very public, um, that in itself may have pressure, but actually at the same time, you're counting the beams, you're running the shop. There's a lot of very ordinary stuff to do to keep a, a charity on the road and to keep it healthy. Mm, particularly if you say a small one such as, yes. such as yours. Yes. Um, perhaps if I could just finish off by asking, drawing on your own experience, what lessons would you give to young women who, who see you and perhaps you might be a role model? Um, what lessons would you give to those women? That you can do things, you know, that you can achieve things and um, that you need to be confident. You need to have a belief in yourself um, that you don't have to be brash and you don't have to be pushy, but you have to be determined. Mm. Um, and I think you can achieve things. Um, and I think, I think basing things on evidence really matters. Um, I really think that there's a bit of a so what about opinion. Um, however much you feel you've achieved in your life, your opinion is just your opinion. But evidence, facts and figures, um, evidence from people who've been on the wrong end of systems, who, if you listen, will tell you what it's like to experience a period in prison or to experience a period of time when you've got no home. Um, and, and really learning from that, really using that experience either to enable them to speak for themselves or to represent them, um, together with all the statistical information that you can gather, gives you a basis mm -hmm. for, for feeling rightly confident, not just because your opinion matters. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll conclude our interview there, okay. but thanks very much for speaking to us. It's a pleasure. Okay, thank you very much.